This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. So I spoke last night about prayer, uh, and I'll start off today by speaking about the intellectual life, and then move into what St. Thomas thinks about how they relate. So what is the intellectual life? There's a wonderful little book that I'd like to recommend to all of you called The Intellectual Life. It's Spirit, Conditions, Methods by Dominican Father Antonin Gilbert Sertillonge. And it looks like it's spelled Sertillanges, but that is not how it's spelled. But if you're looking for it on Amazon, that might help you. Um, Sertillonge begins the book describing the intellectual life in terms of a vocation. It's a call by God to dedicate one's life either in whole or in part, to intellectual work. And this vocation, like other invitations of grace, is discerned by considering the gifts, the desires, and the opportunities that God has given to us. In my own life, there have been a few occasions where uh, when I've been listening to a professor and I felt my heart burning within me, uh, and I would say to myself almost involuntarily, that's what I want. I want to be doing what that person is doing. Or in retrospect, I would say to myself, I could see myself doing what that professor was doing. Sertiange thinks that responding to this divine vocation involves earnestly devoting ourselves to study in order to discover the truth and serving the church and society by bringing the truth to others, primarily by writing and speaking. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas rarely uses the term intellectual life, uh, vita intellectualis. Uh, when he does, he, he uses it to refer to something different from Sertiange. Uh, St. Thomas uses it to refer to the kind of life that we have as human beings, a kind of life that's distinct from the life of brute beasts and a kind of life that we share with the angels. So there's a difference in how they use these terms, intellectual life. Uh, but St. Thomas Aquinas was well aware of the fact that while all human beings have intellectual life, certain people dedicate themselves in a special way to intellectual activity. Certain people give themselves in a sustained and exceptional way to the life of the mind, and he himself belonged to this category of people. And so if we want to understand what St. Thomas thought about what Sertillange refers to as the intellectual life, we have to look under different terminology in St. Thomas's works. And that terminology is the contemplative and active lives. Now, you've probably heard the terms active and contemplative applied to religious orders. For example, the Discalced Carmelites are usually referred to as contemplative because they spend much of their days in prayer, uh, while the Sisters of Mercy, for example, are more active because they spend much of their days in works of mercy. But for St. Thomas, the contemplative and active life pertains primarily to individual persons and secondarily to religious orders. So one of my hobbies for the last couple years has been reading about Myers-Briggs personality types and looking up memes about the different types. <laughs> um, but before you conclude that the Thomistic Institute has gone completely off the wall by inviting a pseudoscientist to come to speak to you about <laughs> human psychology, I will admit that I am not aware of any basis in experimental psychology for the Myers-Briggs typology. I just find it uh, that it provides some relatively accurate uh, mental models for understanding different people's preferences, and it's uh, quite entertaining. Uh, now, you might not have heard that St. Thomas Aquinas has his own system of personality typing. Uh, and I imagine that some trained Thomists here might be surprised by this statement. Uh, but that is precisely what St. Thomas is doing with the contemplative and active distinction. Simon Tugwell says about St. Thomas's treatise in the Summa, the one essential insight he had about the distinction between the active and contemplative lives is that it can very properly be interpreted as a distinction between two different kinds of personal bias. So what is this personal bias that St. Thomas thinks distinguishes people? Last night, I spoke about how our rational power can operate through both speculative and practical processes, and we can reason in order to know the truth. We can reason in order to know how to act or to accomplish things. Uh, 
right? We can all perform speculative reasoning and we can all perform practical reasoning. But St. Thomas thinks that each of us is inclined more to one or to the other of these kinds of reasoning. And I think this can be uh, confirmed by our experience. You may know some people who are so continually occupied with theoretical questions that you're, generally, you're genuinely concerned that if you don't walk with them through a busy intersection, they won't be thinking about theoretical questions for much longer. <laughs> and you may know other people who are so intent on accomplishing things that their Instagram feed is sufficient evidence that they are living their best life. They're scuba diving, they're doing good works, ministering to drug addicts on the streets, they're paving their driveway, they're putting a new roof on the shed, and they're generally just not as interested in theoretical questions as they are in engaging with the concrete world and making a difference in it. Right? These are somewhat extreme examples. I think uh, many of us probably fall closer to the middle in this spectrum, but they illustrate St. Thomas's point that we, we tend to have a preference towards one of the other uh, uh, kinds of operations of reason, either speculative or practical. And it's not that contemplatives can't reason practically. And it's not that active persons can't think speculatively. We all want to know the truth and accomplish things. But St. Thomas thinks that each person has a certain predisposition towards one or the other form of life. And St. Thomas goes on to explain that there are certain kinds of actions, certain specific actions that pertain especially to either the contemplative or the active lives. So that we'll find contemplatives doing more of one type of activity and active persons doing other types of activities. In question 180, article 3 of the Secunda Secunde, as the second part of the second part of the Summa, St. Thomas considers what the contemplative life consists in essentially. So what is the heart of the contemplative life? And he concludes, not surprisingly, that the contemplative life is characterized by the very act of contemplation, which is a simple gaze on the truth. A contemplative person is someone who prefers speculative reasoning in order to know the truth for its own sake. And this means that the crowning act of his or her life is the very act of knowing the truth. Contemplatives live for the moments when the truth dawns on them. These are people who are in love with the truth. And so they structure their lives in such a way that they can more readily and regularly get glimpses of the universal and the eternal. So it could be tempting to think that Sertiange's idea of the intellectual life is just his name for what St. Thomas calls the contemplative life, but that's not the case. There's an element of the intellectual life. I'll draw a picture in a moment. There's an element of the intellectual life, as Sertiange understands it, that extends beyond the contemplative life as St. Thomas understands it, and that's the communication of the truth to others. For St. Thomas, the act of teaching or communicating the truth to others is not directed towards God, who's the intelligible truth, but towards others. And so teaching belongs not to the category of acts uh, pertaining especially to the contemplative life, but to the active life. So teaching is an act of the active life. Now what this means is that a Christian intellectual is someone who not only contemplates the truth, but who also hands the truth on to others through the active work of teaching. So I'll try and demonstrate this. I'm not demonstrate it, but I suppose I'm kind of demonstrating it. I'll draw a picture so you can see what I'm trying to say here. So the intellectual life encompasses both contemplative acts and active acts. Coming to know the truth and then communicating it to others. Right? This is what is involved in the intellectual life. Now one or, one or other of these may predominate in an intellectual's life. One person might be much more dedicated to study, while another might be much more dedicated to teaching, depending on their natural predisposition or the requirements of the university at which they teach. Uh, but to fulfill the vocation of an intellectual in service to church uh, and society, 
requires both contemplative and active activities, both the pursuit of knowledge through study and the communication of knowledge through teaching. And for St. Thomas, the ideal is not a purely contemplative life that only seeks knowledge, nor a purely active life that only seeks to communicate knowledge. But the ideal for St. Thomas is a contemplative life that's so full that it overflows in teaching. And so he says famously, just as it is better to illuminate than merely to shine, so it is better to hand on to others what is contemplated than merely to contemplate. And this is where the Dominican gets, I suppose, one of its mottos, contemplata alis tradere, to hand on to others what has been contemplated. Now, when it comes to contemplative activity, which is the basis for teaching and writing, communicating the truth to others, it's, it's no secret that St. Thomas thinks that we can discover all kinds of truths by the natural light of our reason, uh, even without the assistance of grace. In question 12, article 12 of the Prima Pars, the first part of the Summa, St. Thomas quotes St. Augustine, who later in his life, in his retractation, says, St. Augustine is saying, I do not approve what I said, God who wills that only the pure should know truth, for it can be answered that many who are not pure can know many truths. So even, Saint, even though St. Thomas acknowledges the natural limitations of human reason and its weakness as a result of original sin, he's well known for strongly affirming the possible attainments of human reason, even unaided by divine grace. But there's a danger of focusing so intently on what human reason is theoretically capable of achieving, as it were, on its own, that we can lose sight of the ways that God assists reason both in its natural operations and in its operations in the supernatural order. If we lose sight of the role of divine influence and assistance in the intellectual life, we'll correspondingly fail to recognize the importance of prayer in the intellectual life. And unfortunately, I believe this has happened through the centuries. But if we look closely at St. Thomas's life and writings, we find that he undeniably recognizes prayer as having an essential part in what Sertiange refers to as the intellectual life. So prayer really has an essential place in the intellectual life. First of all, you know, what is this place? First of all, St. Thomas sees prayer as an important preparation for all kinds of activities. And that naturally includes study and teaching and, you know, all activities. In the very first article of the question on prayer in the Summa, St. Thomas quotes Pseudo Dionysius, who says, It is useful to begin everything from prayer as giving and uniting ourselves to God. One of the greatest writers of spiritual theology in the last few centuries, Adolf Tanqueray, uh, discusses prayer before other activities as one of the general practical means of perfection, and even calls it a shortcut to perfection to offer all our actions to God before we do them. Why would praying before other activities be helpful? Tanqueray lists a number of reasons, but St. Thomas Aquinas emphasizes one in particular. In Article 14 of the Question on Prayer, St. Thomas asked whether prayer ought to last a long time. And he's dealing with a long-standing question of biblical exegesis and spirituality, that is, what, what do we do with St. Paul's command in 1 Thessalonians 5 to pray without ceasing? Through St. Paul, the Holy Spirit tells us to pray without ceasing. But how is this possible when God also commands us to do all kinds of other things? You can't be paying your taxes and studying mathematics and visiting the sick and praying at the same time, right? Many in the Christian East tended to think that you could. And so we see this in St. John Cashin and the history of hesychasm, the idea of continually repeating a single psalm verse or a phrase like the Jesus prayer over and over again until it becomes automatic and a, a quasi-permanent fixture in your conscious and even your unconscious mind. So in the East, the East tended to take this command to pray without ceasing very literally. Right? You need to actually be praying without ever stopping. But in the West, thinkers like St. Augustine tried to understand St. Paul's command to pray always in such a way that doesn't require us to be always engaged in the very act of prayer. 
which I think is a more reasonable approach, right? God doesn't command the impossible, but I find it quite impossible to request things from God while I'm asleep. So it seems like whatever St. Paul is saying here about praying always or praying without ceasing, it doesn't seem like it can mean we need to be actually requesting things from God without ever stopping. Right? Whatever it means, it doesn't seem that it can mean that. And St. Thomas follows the general Western stream of interpretation, not expecting us to be literally praying at all times. And so he offers a number of ways to understand this command by St. Paul to pray without ceasing, one of which is the following. St. Thomas says, One may pray continually by reason of the effect in the person who prays because he remains more devout even after praying. One may pray continually by reason of the effect in the person who prays because he remains more devout even after praying. And so this is pretty straightforward. When we pray, we offer ourselves to God. Our devotion is increased. This means that prayer itself prepares us to serve God so that whatever we do after prayer can also be done as an offering to God. And in that way, prayer enters virtually into whatever activities follow after prayer. By stirring up love and devotion in us during prayer, the prayer enters virtually into what we do next. And because of this, prayer is an important way for us to sanctify the work that we do, whether it's intellectual life or anything else. But so far, this only proves that prayer is useful before any activity. What does St. Thomas think that prayer contributes specifically to the activities of the intellectual life? Maybe I should have given this as a preface. Why am I talking about this at all? Uh, I mean, a lot of you are college students, and some of you will go on to dedicate your lives to uh, the intellectual life. Right? So hopefully this is applicable to some of you at least. Mm-hmm. But so what does St. Thomas think that prayer contribu- contributes specifically to the activities of the intellectual life? We find the answer in Article 3 of his treatment of the contemplative life. And I don't know why this passage is not better known in Thomistic circles. I, I'm calling it the money quote. And it's on your handout, if you still have your handout from yesterday. Maybe you can look on. Someone near you has it. St. Thomas says, Man attains to the knowledge of truth in two ways. One way through those things which are received from another. And so certainly with respect to those things which man receives from God, prayer is necessary. According to Wisdom 7, I called and the spirit of wisdom came to me. Certainly with respect to those things which he receives from man, hearing is necessary, inasmuch as he receives from the spoken word. And reading is necessary inasmuch as he receives from that which is handed on through Scripture. In another way, it is necessary that he employ his own study, and so meditation is required. So St. Thomas thinks that we need four things to attain to the knowledge of truth. Prayer, hearing, reading, and meditation, or study. Hearing and reading allow us to receive from the teaching of others the principles and the arguments in all different fields of knowledge. This is why the predominant activities of college students are reading textbooks and attending lectures. I mean, this may not be the predominant activity of all college students, but you understand in the ideal, right? This is how it ought to be. But uh, by meditation or study, St. Thomas means the application of our minds, right? If you're going to be an intellectual, you can't just listen to lectures and read books passively receiving information, right? You have to apply your mind to the material so that you thoroughly understand it and make it your own. The reasoning process of the speaker or the author has to become your own thought process. Otherwise, you're not actually learning. Right? Maybe something is stored in memory, uh, but you're not traversing the, uh, you know, the, the rational discourse that's going to enable you to acquire the knowledge in that field of study that you're engaged in. But in any case, I think it's significant that St. Thomas lists prayer even before hearing, reading, and study. He says that prayer is necessary with respect to what we receive from God. 
According to Wisdom 7, I called and the Spirit of Wisdom came to me. And by Spirit of Wisdom, St. Thomas understands here the gift of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And so St. Thomas has in mind, when he says this, the biblical account of King Solomon, who prayed for the gift of wisdom and received it from God. And I didn't know that this was going to be part of morning prayer this morning, so this is very convenient. Uh, I was going to read to you briefly uh, one of the accounts in Scripture of this. Uh, Solomon says in Wisdom 8.21, but I perceive, and following, but I perceived that I would not possess wisdom unless God gave her to me. And it was a mark of insight to know whose gift she was. So I appealed to the Lord and besought him, and with my whole heart I said, O God of my fathers and Lord of mercy, who has made all things by your word and by your wisdom has formed man to have dominion over the creatures you have made and to rule the world in holiness and righteousness and pronounce judgment and uprightness of soul. Give me the wisdom that sits by your throne. All right, but what does wisdom have to do with the intellectual life? Wisdom for St. Thomas, as for Aristotle, is a habit of knowing first principles which enables us to judge rightly about all other things in light of those first principles. In other words, it means to know God and everything else in light of him, to see everything from a divine perspective, which is why Aristotle says in the metaphysics, such a science either God alone can have or God above all others. And the consequence of this knowledge of first principles is to see how everything else fits together. The relative positions of all aspects of reality. So classical education is traditionally sapiential, or it has for its goal the acquisition of wisdom. And so from a classical perspective, a truly educated person is not simply an expert in a single field, but an educated person is someone who has a grasp of Uh, maybe just a fundamental grasp, at least, of all aspects of the universe as a whole and in their relations, and therefore can make good judgments about all of reality and about human life. According to St. John Henry Newman, the proper function of universities is to educate students in this universal knowledge. And of course, good leaders in society need such a comprehensive and ordered view of reality, which is why in the Roman Republic, a liberal arts education is considered a basic necessity for citizens. In any case, what this means is the contemplative life for St. Thomas and the intellectual life for Sertiange are not perfected by the study of physics or psychology or even ethics. A true contemplative and Christian intellectual will undoubtedly have areas of expertise, but he or she will be distinguished above all by wisdom which is knowledge of the highest causes above all God himself and how all things relate to him and to each other. So if you're a chemist, that's great. You'll spend much of your time doing lab experiments, which was my dream growing up, which is why I have stains on the floor in my bedroom still from uh, the experiments that I was doing with the chemicals that I was acquiring. Don't worry, it was all legal. (laughs) But if you want to be more than just a chemist, and you want to be a full-fledged Catholic intellectual, it's not enough to be an expert in chemistry, right? Your thought needs to be informed by the knowledge of God who ordains the laws of nature. If you're a psychologist, that's great. But if you want to be a true Catholic intellectual, your experiments and your guidance of individuals need to be informed by the natural and revealed moral law and take into account the philosophical principles of anthropology, and so on through the other possible careers. So am I here just imposing upon you obligations that are burdens to make your life more difficult? I don't think so, or I hope not. Because as human beings, we naturally desire to know first causes, which means we're made for wisdom. And we need at least some wisdom for an integrated intellectual and human life. If we inhibit our natural desire for coherent and comprehensive knowledge and only pursue a single field of study separate from everything else, we can become malformed intellectually, imbalanced in our knowledge, and consequently imbalanced in our lives. You can imagine a painter who as a child 
used all different colors, but gradually became obsessed with the color blue, so that all he would ever use would be various shades of blue. And he may be the best painter of blue in the world in his adult life, but eventually he'll lose touch with the whole range of beauty in the world, and his paintings will fail to represent reality. He'll probably eventually lose confidence even in his own ability as a painter because he knows that he's neglected all of these other colors. Right? And by analogy, uh, right, something similar can happen if we pursue a single field of study adamantly and neglect for an extended period of time the study of all other aspects of reality. We can lose the ability to think in a balanced way about the world and our own lives. Right? Sometimes as scholars... We can become experts in a particular tree, but once in a while we need to climb up the mountain and take in the whole landscape, right? And this is the function of wisdom. So we, we want a balanced and a relatively comprehensive view of reality. We all naturally desire this and need this to think and live well. And if we dedicate to our, uh, our lives to study, it's especially important so we can keep our balance, so we know a little bit about what wisdom is and a bit of why we need it, but what is the Holy Spirit's gift of wisdom? There's some controversy over St. Thomas's teachings on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but what Thomas will generally agree on is that the gift of wisdom is a habit infused in our souls by God, disposing us to be moved well by the Holy Spirit in our judgment about divine things. So the gift of wisdom is a habit infused in our souls by God, disposing us to be moved by the whole, moved well by the Holy Spirit in our judgment about divine things. And so St. Thomas thinks that prayer is necessary for the contemplative life because it obtains from God the assistance of the Holy Spirit who guides our mind in making right judgments, especially about the highest things. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that only Christians can have wisdom of any kind. Again, St. Thomas is a great defender of the natural capacity of the human mind to attain knowledge, even on a metaphysical level, without, without the assistance of grace. And so it's possible for us to acquire metaphysical, uh, phys philosophical wisdom. We can understand the world in light of certain metaphysical principles, even without the assistance of divine revelation or grace. But there is far more in the mystery of God and in his workings of providence, his grace in individual persons, and his directing of history that is totally inaccessible to philosophy, which is built up on human reason alone. And Christian faith alone provides us with access to the knowledge of these higher and deeper aspects of reality, which we could not know simply by our own reason. Okay, so faith provides us access to this knowledge, right, of the higher and deeper aspects of reality. But it's one thing to have faith in divine revelation, right? That makes you a Christian. But it's another to know how to apply the knowledge of faith in such a way that the, these truths of faith serve as principles that will coordinate all of our thinking so that we have a coherent supernatural reading of reality. And I contend that this requires the inspirations of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. After we've received faith as a gift from God, the inspirations of the gift of wisdom make it possible for those in a state of grace, and especially for those who pray, to see the world from God's perspective in such a way that God alone could see the world and that no one could see by the natural power of reason alone. This infused wisdom is what enabled St. Therese of Lisieux to write in Story of a Soul, Since the time I took my place in the arms of Jesus, I am like the watchman observing the enemy from the highest turret of a strong castle. Nothing escapes my eyes. I am frequently astonished at seeing so clearly. As Catholic intellectuals, we need more than just natural philosophical wisdom, because that will only show us so much. We also need infused wisdom, so that we can see how economics is related to the life of the church, so we can see how physics is related to creation. So we can see how human psychology relates to our eternal destiny. So we can see how history, how real history is related to God and his action. 
right? And so on. We need infused wisdom for this. And so to be an authentic Catholic intellectual, we need to study not only our own fields and balance this with the study of other fields, especially philosophy. We also need to study sacred scripture and theology. And above all, as St. Thomas says, we need to pray. So how does St. Thomas think that we should pray for wisdom? In the Middle Ages, it was especially priests and religious who lived contemplative lives, and their lives were largely structured around the recitation of the divine office. Right, our retreat this weekend is structured around this very much. So it's not surprising that St. Thomas teaches that the Psalms are divinely revealed prayers for wisdom. And so I think St. Thomas would probably tell us that reciting the Liturgy of the Hours is the foremost way of praying for wisdom. But St. Thomas certainly doesn't think that the Psalms are the only way to pray for wisdom. In fact, he composed his own prayer for use before study, which I believe is principally a request for wisdom. And so I'd like to spend a few minutes looking at this prayer. And this is also in your, on your uh, handout. This is my own translation, so it might be slightly different from what you know, other versions you may have come across. Ineffable creator, who from the treasury of thy wisdom didst appoint three hierarchies of angels and set them in wondrous order over the highest heavens, and who didst distribute the parts of the universe most elegantly, do thou who art rightly called the fountain of light and wisdom and supereminent principle, deign to, pray, to pour a ray of thy brightness upon the darkness of my intellect, removing from me the twofold darkness in which I was born, namely sin and ignorance. Thou who makest eloquent the tongues of infants, instruct my tongue and pour onto my lips the grace of thy blessing. Give me sharpness of understanding, capacity for remembering, method and ease in learning, subtlety of interpreting, and copious grace of speaking. Prepare the beginning, direct the progress, and perfect the ending. Thou who art truly God and man, who livest and reignest forever and ever. Amen. So there's a lot that we could talk about in this prayer. Many of the words and phrases have significant resonances with other parts of St. Thomas's corpus. But I'd like to just point out a few things that I don't know that has any rhyme or reason, but as I was reading through the prayer, I thought I'd like to talk about those things. So a fair number of translations, you may have noticed this if you, you know, pull up St. Thomas's uh, prayer before study, you know, if this is already part of your life to pray this, you might have noticed that a fair number of translations leave out the whole opening portion, who from the treasury of thy wisdom didst appoint three hierarchies of angels and set them in wondrous order over the highest heavens and who didst distribute the parts of the universe most elegantly. A lot of translations just leave that out completely. But this part has a number of important functions in the prayer. First of all, it indicates a sapiential approach to study. God himself, from his wisdom, orders all things. As the medievals are fond of repeating, wisdom reaches mightily from one end of the earth to the other, and she orders all things well. And because God orders all things in his wisdom, that means that we can actually learn about the universe. And even more importantly, the study of the universe can and should lead us to the knowledge of the one who created it. As second, St. Thomas sets up an approach to study that's epistemologically realist. When we're studying authentically, we're not imposing our own invented categories on the world or just giving names to things that have no constitutional essences or merely coming into contact with our own perceptions. No, when we study rightly, we can discover the truth about reality and thereby participate in the wisdom of God himself who designed and created all things. So study allows us to reproduce in our own minds the wisdom of God. All right, third, St. Thomas sets up a very broad range for study. We don't find any restriction of reality in this prayer within the theoretical limitations of biological naturalism or mechanistic physicalism. Scripture says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the creed says that he created all things visible and invisible. And correspondingly, in St. Thomas's prayer, God is acknowledged as the origin of the invisible hierarchies of angels, as well as all the visible parts of the universe. And so human study can be directed toward invisible things or any part of the visible universe. And all of it reveals God himself, who's ineffable. As Father Tom spoke about at the conclusion of his talk, 
God himself is ineffable yet truly knowable through his creatures, though in a, in a limited way, and we know more about what God is not than what he is. Fourth, St. Thomas invokes the angels. When I first encountered this prayer as an undergraduate, I thought the mention of hierarchies of angels was a bit antiquated and frankly unnecessary. I wanted to get right to asking God for help, right? Because my Latin test was coming up. But I've recently come to learn much more about how St. Thomas was profoundly influenced by Pseudo-Dionysius. And Dionysius teaches not only that the angels belong to the order of divine governance of the world, but even more importantly, they mediate divine light. The angels are named for being messengers. This means that the angels are involved in our coming to know the truth, especially about divine things. St. Thomas thinks that the angels can do this in two ways, by directly proposing things to us and also by strengthening our intellectual power. And so the angels are not just there to help protect us from falling down the stairs, although thankfully they do this uh, quite a bit. <clears throat> They're far more concerned with illuminating our minds and sharing with us the wisdom of God. And perhaps you have the experience of being close to teachers of great intellectual power, and you've experienced a kind of temporary elevation to their level. Right? I'm, not, I'm not saying this is the same thing, but there's maybe something analogous here to the experience of the angels who by their presence strengthen our intellectual power. And so my, the point is here, if we're studying, it's good to acknowledge the angels, right? because they constitute a significant portion of the universe that we hope to understand. They're intellectual creatures who are concerned for our well-being, they have far greater knowledge of God and of nature than we do, and they want to assist us in coming to know the truth. Right, St. Thomas is called the angelic doctor, not only because of his angelic purity, but also because he didn't forget about the angels. So moving on to the heart of the prayer, do thou who art rightly called the fountain of light and wisdom and super eminent principle, Deign to pour a ray of thy brightness upon the darkness of my intellect, removing from me the twofold darkness in which I was born, namely sin and ignorance. So first we see here the importance of interior teaching by God. God is not only the source of all created things which we study, God is also the source of all intellectual light by which we learn. And even though God has given us the light of reason, its motion or the use of our reason still depends on his influence. And so it's reasonable to pray for God's assistance in study, even when the objects of our study pertain to the natural order. But as I said before, God also gives us the gifts of the Holy Spirit by which he guides our minds in a supernatural way. And so we should especially pray for God's assistance in study through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. During my master's program, I experienced something that was pretty consequential for the rest of my academic life, which has been fairly short so far. God willing, it goes on longer. I was reading Pope St. John Paul II's Gift and Mystery, which is a reflection on his, his uh, priesthood. And he's reflecting on his seminary formation. And he says, in order to be authentically formative, study needs to be constantly accompanied by prayer, meditation, and the invocation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. St. Thomas Aquinas explains how with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, a person's whole spiritual being becomes responsive to God's light. And when I read this, I knew immediately that I had to begin invoking the gifts of the Holy Spirit. From, so from that point on, whenever I sat down to study, I would do that first. Come Holy Spirit, come with your gifts of wisdom and understanding, and knowledge, counsel, Piety, fear of the Lord. I go through the list. And I have to tell you that my experience of education changed immediately and radically at that point. Now, I'm not claiming here to be oh, that I'm always obedient to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit that I've received. Um, but once I began praying for the gifts of the Holy Spirit before study, there was a, a wholly new and seamless integration of my study with my life. 
which was not my own doing. And I know that because I tried to do it myself before and it was very stressful and not super successful. But once I started invoking the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I found uh, that it seemed to me that God himself was speaking to me regularly through my textbooks, right? And not just the Bible, but the material that I was studying. I was encountering God through my studies in a way that I just wasn't before I was asking the Holy Spirit for his gifts. And I was finding that what I was studying was applying directly to my life, right? And I can only attribute that to the Holy Spirit. So getting back to St. Thomas's prayer, when St. Thomas is praying for a ray of brightness, he is almost certainly asking for the inspirations of the gift of wisdom and teaching us to do the same. And in the heart of the prayer, St. Thomas also reminds us of our, of our added poverty on account of sin. Uh, he mentions sin here in, in a prayer before study. And it's important for us to recognize that our intellectual activities are not independent of our moral condition. Right? Sin is not simply a matter of wrong willing. It's also an effect of wrong thinking. And over time, sin cements in our minds wrong patterns of judgment. Right? The intellectual life is especially threatened by certain sins. St. Thomas discusses concupiscence as an obstacle to contemplation, which is why purity is so important for the intellectual life. And a life of se- a consecrated celibacy is, in fact, the best context for study. But there are also less carnal and more spiritual temptations to pride and envy and vanity. And we need God's grace so that our intellectual work will not be directed by self-love or become a way of expressing or aggrandizing our egos, but will remain about knowing the truth, the objective truth that transcends ourselves, and serving God and others through generously communicating that truth. There's always a temptation in the intellectual life to make things easier for ourselves, to ignore an inconvenient truth to get something published, or to overlook a flaw in our thesis to get past the defense, or to round some numbers in order to put them in a, a different category in the Excel document. But the intellectual life is demanding precisely because God himself, who is the truth, demands the highest level of commitment to the truth. And so the intellectual life is a kind of lifelong mental martyrdom. It requires real courage, perseverance, and sacrifice. But of course, the discipline of study in time bears the fruit of the joy of discovery. And even our limited contemplation in this life is a kind of participation in the life of heaven which will consist essentially in the vision of God, who is the truth itself. And Sirach 6 gives some encouraging words about the discipline of pursuing wisdom that maybe some of you especially who are, you know, inflamed with the love of wisdom may find encouraging. My son, from your youth up, choose instruction, and until you are old, you will keep finding wisdom. Come to her like one who plows and sows and wait for her good harvest. For in her service you will toil a little while and soon you will eat of her produce. She seems very harsh to the uninstructed. A weakling will not remain with her. She will weigh him down like a heavy testing stone and he will not be slow to cast her off. For wisdom is like her name and is not manifest to many. Listen, my son, and accept my judgment. Do not reject my counsel. Put your feet into her fetters and your neck into her collar. Put your shoulder under her and carry her and do not fret under her bonds. Come to her with all your soul and keep her ways with all your might. Search out and seek and she will become known to you. And when you get hold of her, do not let her go. For at last you will find the rest she gives and she will be changed into joy for you. Then her fetters will become for you a strong protection and her collar a glorious robe. Her yoke is a golden ornament, and her bonds are a cord of blue. You will wear her like a glorious robe and put her on like a crown of gladness. So we need God's assistance to remain steadfast on the difficult paths of intellectual work when it's tempting to cut corners and be self-serving rather than to serve God and others. And finally, 
St. Thomas prays, Thou who makest eloquent the tongues of infants, instruct my tongue and pour unto my lips the grace of thy blessing. Here we see that dimension of the intellectual life that has to do with service or the active life. The angels don't just receive divine light from God and keep it to themselves. They turn to those below them and share what they've received. The Dominican order was instituted not for the sake of study, but for the sake of preaching. And so the obligation that Dominicans have to study is understood in light of the obligation to preach. And so St. Thomas Aquinas, in turn, who both studied the activity of the angels and who professed life as a Dominican preacher, in his prayer before study, doesn't forget teaching, the handing on of what's contemplated to others, that necessary element of the intellectual life that's concerned with service. And so if we're called to the intellectual life, we should make it a habit not only to pray before study, but also before teaching and writing, so that our words will be effective in educating others. And perhaps even more important than the prayer that St. Thomas wrote for use before study, we have his own example of the way that he practiced theology. There are many quotations that I could give you, and I'll share with you just one, especially because we're running out of time. St. Thomas had a lifelong socius, a friar who accompanied him to assist him in his duties as a preacher and teacher. And his, this, name's man, uh, this man's name was Reginald Paperno. And one point after St. Thomas died, Reginald was in the midst of a lecture when he stopped and related with enormous weeping. Brothers, I was prohibited by my master during his life from revealing the wonderful things that I had seen concerning him, among which was that he had his knowledge, which was wonderful before others, not by human genius, but by merit of prayer. For whenever he wished to study, to dispute, to lecture, to write, or to dictate, first approaching a secret place of prayer, he used to pray bathed with tears for divinely inspired discovery of the hidden truth. And there are many other accounts of when St. Thomas was facing some difficulty in his work, and he would prostrate himself and pray with copious tears, imploring the help of God for understanding. And I think it's important for us to recognize that St. Thomas is not special in this respect. God doesn't work differently with the saints than he does with us, but he gives the saints to us as examples. And so if we ask God for his assistance in the tasks of our intellectual lives, he'll come to our aid. And I'd like to conclude by offering a practical recommendation. Right, one of the fascinating things about St. Thomas's personal practice of prayer is how he regularly appealed to the saints for help. In fact, when I was studying his life, he called on the saints far more than I was expecting to see. And so I'd like to recommend to you, besides the Liturgy of the Hours, and besides St. Thomas's prayer before study, especially the Holy Rosary. Perhaps you're familiar with the 15 Rosary Promises, which many people believe were given by the Blessed Virgin Mary to Blessed Alan de la Roque. And the eighth promise is this. Those who are faithful to recite the Rosary shall have during their life and at their death the light of God, and the plenitude of his graces. And as Christian scholars, there's nothing that we need more than the light of God. And so I happily recommend the Rosary of Our Lady to you, especially on this Saturday, and with the Feast of the Rosary just being two days ago. Uh, and in this, I know I have the support and agreement of the Dominicans <laughs> who are sponsoring this retreat. That's, that's, that's what I have for you this afternoon. I know this is a little heavier than last night, but are there any questions? Yeah. So, um, wisdom yeah. is divine wisdom is clearly a topic we've thought a lot about. Um, throughout many places in the Old Testament, Psalms, and like the wisdom literature, wisdom is sort of personified in female terms. Mm -hmm. um, do you, can you think of any reason, like the fittingness for why? particular like wisdom is feminine it's a great question do you, do you have a oh so the, <laughs> the oh, thank you i thought you're like i got this <laughs> uh so the question uh from william was wh uh, why do i think that uh wisdom was portrayed in uh feminine terms in the old testament and I mean, for the, the, the primary response you would want to get from a biblical scholar, right? Um, because they will be able to give you some of the historical reasons uh, why that, you know, 
may have come to be in, in the Hebrew wisdom tradition. Um, you know, I just ended on the, the note of Our Lady. Um, this isn't necessarily going in the proper order of things. Uh, so, well, all right, so instead of talking about Our Lady, um, you know, wisdom is often attributed not only to Christ, the Son, but to the Holy Spirit who, is, who gives the gift of wisdom. And I was told to say something controversial in this podcast. Uh, <laughs> um, and there's certainly nothing more controversial that I could say for perhaps more conservative listeners uh, than to say that, uh, of course, God is beyond all gender, right? Um, and yet you want to find in God by analogy certain um, principles, uh, some, some analogous terms, right, to what we would see as, uh, you know, gender here. And, and this means you would, you could perhaps attribute certain more masculine or feminine attributes and kind of line them up with divine attributes. Um, And so if you do this with the Trinity, you could say that the Holy Spirit in a certain way corresponds to the more feminine uh, kind of attributes in humanity of this kind of nurturing, this kind of intimate communion with people. The Holy Spirit is the fathers see it. The Holy Spirit is, um, uh, he's like, he's nurturing us, right? By He's the one who brings us into communion with God. He, the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us to cry, Abba, Father, right? Just as a mother teaches her child to call her, the child's father, you know, dad. You know, the, the mother's goal is to have the child's first words be not mom, but dad, right? And so we can see there is a certain tradition of reflection on the Holy Spirit in this kind of feminine way. Now, where you don't want to, you know, where people get in trouble is, uh, well, there's lots of ways you can get in trouble by following this train of thought. I mean, you always want to maintain that there's a reason why God revealed himself primarily, fundamentally in masculine terms. And it's not because he's a man, although he is in the incarnation, but in his divine nature, God is the initiator of creation and of redemption. And in that respect, he has these this what you might call masculine kind of characteristics of being the fundamental origin and font of all that is, right? In that respect, he reveals himself. I think for that reason, he reveals himself, especially in masculine terms, right? Why he becomes a man, right? Instead of becoming incarnate as a woman to show that he is the initiator of human salvation. Uh, so you don't want to lose track of kind of this primary sense of understanding the kind of by analogy, God's fatherhood, and you know, and the, the reality of God's fatherhood. Um, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to say that, well, therefore there's nothing that you can by analogy say from femininity that might apply to God. Right. Uh, and so I think in some sense you could, you know, theologians who do this, uh, you know, say Maximilian Colby, for example, um, who are going to do this kind of analogous thinking about God are going to attribute to the Holy spirit, especially the feminine or motherly kind of activities of God. And because the Holy Spirit is especially associated with the gift of wisdom, I think it's fitting that then the gift of wisdom is going to be uh, described in feminine terms. So that's kind of like the theological response. And the the, uh, kind of like derivative of that is you find, especially in uh, St. Louis de Montfort, who meditated on wisdom extraordinarily. He has a whole work on the love of eternal wisdom, which I'll actually quote from tomorrow. Uh, He loves to look at the Old Testament mentions of wisdom, especially in light of Our Lady. Uh, Because of her intimate union with the Holy Spirit, she's the one who especially exemplifies for us uh, the gift of wisdom kind of in in its operation. And so it's especially, St. Louis de Montfort thinks that it's especially by devotion to Mary that we acquire from the Holy Spirit this gift of wisdom. And so when he reads a lot of these passages in the Old Testament, he sees them not only as referring to divine wisdom, the incarnate son of God, but also the blessed Virgin Mary. And so you say, you know, all the passages that are talking about inviting us to come under her shelter, right? Well, that's an invitation to come under the shelter of Our Lady. And by that way, you participate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot that's been done in the theological and spiritual tradition as to why we have kind of feminine terms for wisdom. Um, But again, I suppose in somewhat proper theological method, you would first want to hear a biblical scholar's account, which I cannot give you. Oh my gosh, there's lots of questions. You, I have, there was a biblical scholar I took who 
the primary thing I remember him saying was the there was a difference between the tree of life and the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. Um, but the tree of knowledge was um, described as something often in wisdom, like a, a fruit that, like a, as you're saying, like a motherly figure who bears fruit, who invites her children to come in and to, to eat hmm. of her. Um, obviously, they're, I mean, they're so much more than that. But. Yes, that's <laughs> interesting. It reminds me of, um, uh, you know, s- uh, somewhere in the wisdom literature, um, it, uh, come to me and eat, right? He who eats will hunger for more. Uh, it's talking about the desire for wisdom. Uh, now, we, we wouldn't want to confuse the, the kind of the tree of knowledge of good and evil as being uh, like real wisdom, uh, because it would, right, this is obviously uh, when Adam and Eve are deceived by the devil. Um, and it's through a desire for, it's an inordinate desire for wisdom that leads them to the fall. Um, uh, and, you know, we can, Maybe we can talk more about that later, about exactly kind of how the fathers uh, and doctors read the, the Genesis story. Dane? Yeah, so um, all throughout the talk, I was really struck by like these like three main like phases of like prayer, learning, and then finally um, uh, action, um, uh, which I like to think of as like healing, really, uh, because um, I see that really embodied in an experience I had all throughout high school, which was... Um, a summer theology institute called Saints and Scholars at Holy Cross, per the shirt I'm wearing mm-hmm. right now. And that's quite literally the motto of it, pray, learn, heal. Um, and so I remember this being like distinct, distinctly formative for my theological voice and, you know, discerning a uh, vocation towards academic theology mm-hmm. and intellectual life. And so my question really is then, um, at what age do you think this formation of students to, you know, be attuned to, like, the possibility of, like, an academic vocation. When do you think that's appropriate? Do you think high school would be, like, a good time to start on that route, or do you think that should be earlier, um, since a lot of this, like, intellectual life, as we've said, um, is modeled after a college student's life? So when do you think we should start thinking about this? Uh, so Dane's asking, um, you know, when, when practically speaking, should we, di- should we be discerning a vocation to the intellectual life? Kind of at what point of our educational path should that consideration happen? Um, you know, I, I think back of how useful it would have been if I hadn't spent so much time playing Mario 64 and had instead been learning Latin when I was younger. Um, This is a good question. Uh, Sertiange, he addresses his book, especially, I think, to undergraduates. And his idea there is, um, why does he do that? He, he's approaching students who are already, you know, you also need the material and like the temporal goods to be able to study. Not everyone can afford to study. Not everyone has the time to study. So practically speaking, you know, part of the discernment is you need the opportunities uh, if God is calling you to it, he'll give you the, the means to fulfill the vocation. Um, and so if someone is already embarking on a path of higher education, I could say if you're really not interested in college at all, when you come out of high school, I would say that's probably a sign you're not, in, you know, you, you're probably not as likely called to the intellectual life. Now, not necessarily, you know, but um, typically I think you would have some type of attraction to study, right, when you're coming out of high school. Uh, but Sertiange is focusing on, I think, undergraduates because they're in a place where they're they're starting to actually um, dedicate their lives to this work. And you have, you know, college is a, a time where you're making decisions about what you're going to do with your life. Uh, it's one of the main functions of the undergraduate time is, is it's a kind of discernment time for how you're going to serve others. Uh, and so it's I think it's a very fruitful time to have this to go through this process of discernment. Um, for me, it was very late. Like I, um, you know, it only came to me very late. And that's probably largely through my own fault. Um, so I'd say the best time to start considering it is now for whoever you are. Um, and you know, just with everything, like parents ought to be attentive to not only the, the natural dispositions of their children, but also whatever kind of attractions of grace or gifts that they have and foster those. Uh, and, you know, you have a, a child who's just really fat, you know, just really loves the truth. Well, try and foster opportunities for them 
to have more engaging experiences of learning. You know, if your child's really into soccer, put them in a league, right? You know, if their interests foster those. And then I think the, the child is then more well disposed to follow that path longer on. You know, ex expose them to religious life, right? Expose them to all different possible vocations in life. Uh, you know, and I think the earlier, the better. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's kind of vague. But I'd say the earlier, the better you can get people thinking about this. I remember walking with my dad down the road when I was in, I don't remember, elementary school. And he was describing the process of how many years it takes to get a bachelor's, the master's, and the doctorate. And I remember walking down the road and like adding up the number of years it would take me to be a doctor. And I wasn't even expecting, by the time I was done with my master's program, I wasn't even thinking I'd go back for a doctorate. But when I was younger, I had this strange operation of grace, I suppose, in my life walking down the road where I was just thinking about, yeah, someday, someday I'll just keep studying for like most of my life. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, good parenting, you want to pick up on those things and foster those interests. And yeah, those are just thoughts that come to my mind. But that's a great question. But if you haven't thought about it, think about it. That's part of the reason why I am talking about this today is because a lot of you are still in the point where you may be making decisions about your future. And it's worth considering, you know, do you have the gifts? You know, do you have the opportunities? Uh, you know, could this be something that's more than just an interest of yours, but actually a vocation from God? Something that, you know, that your role in society in the church is to, is to really dedicate your life to study in a kind of sacrificial, adamant way. Yes, Father Jonah. Yeah, I have a question. So could you speak kind of about um, people who have this call, perhaps, but might not find employment doing so? The, the reality is it's very hard to find employment as an intellectual, um, but you still, you're still called to know, to seek wisdom, to seek the truth, and to share it with others in other ways. Is this something you give a thought to? Or... Yeah. So Father Jonah is uh, asking if I thought about the uh, kind of different ways the intellectual life can be lived out because not everyone, you know, there's not everyone can live the, let's say an academic life, right? There's, there are few positions available, uh, where you can be funded to research and to teach. Um, and even if you get one, it's still barely enough to live on, right? In some places. Uh, so I would say that falls under the category of discerning opportunities, uh, and also discerning your gifts. Um, but Serge Ange says that the intellectual life, you know, as he talks about it, is not only a kind of, it, it, the call doesn't only come in the form of a, a kind of complete dedication of all of your time to the intellectual life, right? He, he says that if you have a certain grace of this vocation, all you need is two hours a day. He says to read, to write, to study. You can do this in your free time. You know, uh, if you feel that really, if you believe that God is actually calling you to contribute to society in this way, um, especially through communicating the truth, um, then you can do this in your free time. You know, but obviously, you know, you know, living wisely means also paying attention to fulfilling the duties of our state in life. And if you're a, a father or a mother that needs to provide for a family, well, if you can't afford to dedicate all your time to study, then God is clearly not calling you to it, right? He's calling you to something else. And maybe you can use the, the, any free time that you have to dedicate yourself to study and to, you know, maybe you're really good at writing Facebook posts, right? And this is a way of communicating the truth to others, right? And, and that can be a kind of expression of the intellectual life. I'd say that's probably not necessarily the way to go immediately, but like, um, there are ways. Yeah, there are certainly ways. And of course, the intel, um, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas says that everyone, because everyone ha every human being has intellectual life, that means that no one is going to be satisfied with a life that is uh, purely active, with no pursuit of the truth at all. And of course, as Christians, we're also called by Christ to evangelize. And that means also speaking the truth to others, right? When the opportunity provides itself, when the promptings of grace are there. Yeah, Patrick. How does one deal with the the way in which particular circumstances, opportunities, states of life uh, limit your capacity to actualize your intellectual potential? 
So, for example, you gave the example of having a family, mm-hmm. and there's a, there's a serious way in which family life restricts your capacity to to study or to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's developing you in a different way, in a good mm-hmm. way, like it's mm-hmm. teaching you charity. Um, but there's there's a certain sense in which there is a sacrifice made there. Um, there's a limit. There's limits of time and energy and and, and devotion to certain things. Um, I'm thinking of my own life currently too. Uh, I would say that my, my passion is, is philosophy and theology, and I'm teaching middle school science right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I love it. It's it's a wonderful time. I am certainly <laughs> growing in virtue in ways I never <laughs> anticipated. Um, but there's there's an ongoing sense in which I, I'm I'm sacrificing something that I could, that I see could be a very that is a gift and, mm-hmm. and um, I, something that I want to develop. So like, how do you how do you balance those those goods that that see that see are very genuine and are appear to be God given gifts and mm-hmm. potentials? Um, how do you balance the fact that they can't all be put into practice? Yeah, so that's a good question. So Patrick is asking, you know, how do you balance <clears throat> in your life the pursuit of various goods that are true goods, family life, uh, especially if you have. Um, if you have some sense of a vocation to the intellectual life, how do you, how do you balance this out? Because if you live, uh, if you're caring for a family, a lot of your time is necessarily dedicated to raising your family, um, raising your children. Um, so, you know, the, the initial concern it seemed to me that you were voicing was, you know, it seems like maybe you have a particular potential for great intellectual achievements. It, there is something of the reality of life that we all have great potential for lots of things, right? We all can accomplish a lot more than we actually think we can, right? And the, the reality of our lives is that we cannot dedicate ourselves to fulfilling all of our possible potentials, right? It, it just can't be done, right? There's far more uh, that we are capable of doing than we could actually do. Uh, and so on some level, maybe an initial point is, you know, uh, an approach of humility that's saying, you know, I may not be able to develop all that I could possibly be, right, in all realms of my life, right? It's just not, it's not possible. Um, Now, if you really want to, if, you know, if you really want to develop the intellectual life, have a sense of calling to it, then maybe join the Dominicans, right? Because then you don't have to, you know, you, you have the time, to dedicate to intellectual work. Um, so, but how do you manage it? I think, I think this is like a matter of ongoing discernment because just like, I mean, it seems to me that with the great struggles and, and growth and wisdom in general in life is how do you balance everything? Like as a human being, how do you balance all the different needs and desires and obligations and, um, you know, it'd be great if we didn't have to eat in some sense, right? You can get a lot more done, but that's not going to help us flourish as human beings. And um, so I'd say it's just a matter of, of discernment. So the more you have a conviction that God is calling you to a particular activity, I'd find I would find ways to prioritize that in your life, right? You have a real sense that God is calling you to do long-term work in theology, find a way to dedicate an hour at some point in the day to reading theology, right? And, and prioritize according to your discernment of what, you know, particular goods you feel invited to by God. Um, but everything, I mean, it's a balancing act all the way through. And it, and there are seasons, there are times where we have to like go with the, the give and take of life that there are certain times where you can spend more time in study. This is why, you know, you spend a lot of time in university if you're going to go into that kind of life. You dedicate a significant portion of your life to study, right? To develop the habits and some of the knowledge that'll be foundational for the rest of your work. Um, but I, but it has to be in a kind of moment by moment, you know, day by day discernment with God as how He's moving you at each stage of your life. I can't say, well, I'll dedicate the next ten years to studying whatever. Like you don't know what's going to happen in the next ten years. You know, you kind of work as, as phase comes along with phase. Say, all right, I have enough money that I can set aside this next period of time for whatever. Um, so I'd say it's a matter of humility, prioritizing what you feel are, you know, you're most called to, and then uh, kind of taking the discernment step by step as you go through your life. 
Yeah, awesome. I was thinking about the Paris context where the four temperaments are very, very popular. And I was wondering if there's a clear place of a symbiotic relationship, like symbiotic, symbiotic relationship, between like the active and the contemplative thing we were discussing, or if there's a danger or maybe a risk involved because the ends of these two conversations are maybe aiming at different things at the end of the day um, for Aquinas. So, uh, so Austin, you're asking, uh, you brought up the four temperaments, right? And, and so first of all, there's a question of what is the relation of that maybe to the intellectual life? Yeah. So would Aquinas situate this somewhere within the framework described concretely in a certain place or in, in those contexts where people are, are looking at that as a part of their discernment, right? Like oh yeah. Yeah. Like there's psychological tendencies maybe. Right. Does, how, is that part of your discernment process? I would say absolutely it's part of your discernment process. I mean, if you just can't sit still for long enough to read, you're probably not called in the which is part of the reason why it took me so long to get into it. Um, is because it's just not, you know, it's hard for me to sit down and read. Um, so you're like, well, maybe God is not calling. You know, so that's part of the, the process, the discernment process. Now, what's interesting, I don't know. I mean, the four temperaments go back to Aristotle, right? But does St. Thomas himself say, does he talk about, I'm not aware of him using those. I mean, he uses like, he'll like talk about bile and stuff, but I don't know if he'll ever talk about, if he'll talk about the, specifically that type of classification of people by, are you aware of, have you, I've not seen that. So I can't speak to any interaction there. You know, is there a danger? Yeah, there's a danger when you deal with any, too much of the personality typing and all of that. Um, because the, the danger is that you can, you can limit what is, truly potential in everyone. You know, there, there's the potential. You can, you can be really restless, but you can, through discipline, d uh, develop habits of more stable living, right? And you can, by discipline and the grace of God, accomplish things that by nature you're very, not, very much not predisposed to. So, you know, St. Thomas talks about seeds of virtue, I believe, where he talks about, you know, certain people have certain predispositions towards certain virtues. Um, they're just naturally disposed towards it. Um, now that doesn't mean that you can only develop those virtues that you have natural predispositions for. You can also, you, you can and should develop all the virtues. It just may be easier for you to develop some rather than others. So some personality types, you know, I had a, a housemate who he found it easy and often did just spend his whole day in his room reading. Now that that's great. If you want to learn a lot, I can't do that. Um, what, what is the outcome? It means he's probably going to know a lot more than me. <laughs> you know, in the long run, um, you know, at least in this life. Um, I'm not making claims about our eternal destinies. I'm saying we can't make claims about that. That was my point. Um, yes, but I have thought about that. You know, what's interesting is because I mentioned before, I, I do enjoy the Myers-Briggs typology. I don't know if you've done any of that. Um, there they go. Uh, Jung goes a little more into kind of the different types of intellectual preferences that people have. Um, and so you have certain types that that enjoy kind of uh, like synthesizing material as, as others enjoy kind of maybe seeing connections between things that are not readily apparent to others. And those you could see as certain types of gifts that are useful in the intellectual life. Right. If you have a gift for seeing connections between very different ideas, that allows you to be tremendously creative in your you know output. Whereas if you have gifts that are very good at. Um, you know, anal you know, analytical gifts, those are going to be very useful in other ways. You know, so your contributions will somewhat conform to also your natural gifts that God has given you and the kind of the ways your mind and even your brain, they find, you know, your brain tends towards, uh, you can see it even in children. You know, you watch one child who will, he'll just stare at a pattern on the rug for a long time. You know, well, he'll really, he'll, when he gets older, his brain, you know, his brain will tend to be stronger in the areas of pattern recognition, which is going to be, you know, later on can develop into intellectual pattern recognition. And that'll be a useful tool, whereas someone else might have other kind of observational tools in their toolbox. Okay, cool.